right. So um, bare ground then, well, it's critically important for uh, a surprising number of species actually. Um, and when, when, I, when we talk about bare ground, we're really talking about those early successional stage habitats. So where there's no or very, very little vegetation growth at the, at the surface of the ground. Um, and I think in recent years, uh, there's been more interest in how we try to recover species that depend at least for part of their life cycles on these kinds of habitats. Um, but it's not as simple as you might expect. Um, actually, conserving those species requires quite a bit of thought, as I think will become obvious uh, through the rest of the afternoon. So how important is bare ground uh, for species recovery? Well. There was um, a very useful analysis that was done about a decade ago by Natural England. Um, and what they did in, in that research was basically look at a whole range of uh, hundreds of species um, listed on the uh, UK Biodiversity Action Plan when that was uh, still around. Um, and look, looked at those biodiversity priority species. Um, and for each broad habitat type, they then looked in particular at which kinds of niches or microhabitats uh, were particularly important for those species within each broad habitat type. Um, and interestingly what they found is that bare ground was really important across a, a range of habitat types. Um, I won't obviously go through the full results now but you can look that up it's uh, in a, a really nice publication that's available on Natural England's website. Um, Natural England Research Report number 24 it is. And they basically found that bare ground was, as I say, really critical for a wide range of species across different habitats. And importantly, what seems to be happening is that very general approaches to habitat management might be missing out some of these nuances, some of these particular features that, the, uh, that these species need. Um, and bare ground itself provides a number of, uh, of features that are important to these species. Uh, for example, uh, often we think that it's probably to do with the, the climatic conditions uh, at that ground air interface. Basically, you get warmer conditions. Um, and also where the ground is bare, you obviously have more opportunities to burrow. And for some species, particularly invertebrates, that's especially important to be able to uh, dig into uh, very friable soils um, and for some species as well just the lack of vegetation means they have a wider field of view and it's easier for them to hunt down prey so there's a there's a range of reasons why bare ground is important and that will vary uh, by species evidently and I think there's kind of three broad ways that uh, bare ground can be created and then maintained Firstly, looking at how it's how it's created naturally. Um, well, it can be, for example, by the action of the wind and, and sometimes the waves, as you can see in this photo here on sand dunes. Um, flooding can help and natural grazing can help as well. And secondly, we can create bare ground ourselves through conservation uh, efforts. And that might be, for example, through burning, could be through removing vegetation by cutting, we can institute a grazing regime uh, and we can also go in with machines or hand tools. Uh, we can even create a huge mess as we can see in this in this case here, uh, but fantastic creation of bare ground and that will really help a whole range of species I'm sure, uh, even though at first sight it can look like it, it's potentially harmful. But actually a lot of bare ground conservation when you look at it, it's about disturbance regimes, and there can be a little bit of a um, a little bit of a paradox there. People uh, can sometimes think, "Oh, should you be really creating so much disturbance?" But some species really do need this disturbance to to be able to persist. And the third category of where bare ground is created, I suppose, is is where it's done incidentally. Uh, so something else, um, we do something else to the landscape. And, and by the by, we, we create bare ground. So that might be, for example, um, through creating trackways, as you can see here through, uh, through Heathland. Might be just through the action of people wandering across the site or 
maybe the way that we maintain sites. Uh, so I've heard, for example, some cricket grounds and uh, other recreational sites um, because we keep them um, keep the the sward uh, at a very uh, close level. You know, it's almost bare ground, and that can be really useful for a range of species, even if we're not really intending to do that when we carry out that kind of management. So um, in terms of the broad picture about where bare ground uh, species recovery is going, I think there's some interesting queries here, uh, some to do with the, the scale of bare ground that we have to create, how much of it, um, whether it's in one big block uh, in a landscape or whether it's in smaller blocks through, throughout the landscape and whether at the site level um, you create a, quite a, a mosaic of, of bare ground with more vegetated habitat as for example the sand lizard needs but some species don't like that they like much broader expanses of bare ground so there's some quite interesting issues there about how we cater for species that have uh, contrasting requirements as, as Dan Hall was talking about this morning. Um, and once we've created bare ground how do we actually maintain it in the long term? Uh, some of the methods we use are really quite intensive uh, and perhaps onerous. So there's a nice picture on the left here of um, uh, some work that was done under the Gems and the Dunes project, part of Back from the Brink, where we worked with volunteers to create uh, open sand for and uh, designed for sand lizards in that case. Um, but that's a lot of effort uh, on, on a small scale. How do you make how do you mainstream that effort to make sure that bare ground is created? uh across a landscape and maintained across a landscape you know rabbits and other natural graziers are part of the solution perhaps not the whole solution i suspect for some of these species and what will a change in climate mean um presumably shorter winters and lower growing seasons uh, longer growing seasons sorry will probably make it more challenging to maintain bare ground but that's a, an interesting topic perhaps we can reflect on a bit later so I will um, wrap up there. Just a few comments from me as a bit of a taster. I shall finish on a gratuitous shot of a petalwort, a nice lower plant, and the feature of um, uh, Back from the Brink uh, and Gems in the Dunes as we've been working on the last few years. And I will just stop there and hand over to uh, my colleague, uh, Sophie Lake, who will be talking a bit about work done on the Dorset Heathland Heart project in Back from the Brink. Hello. Well, it's great to be here today and to be able to tell you a little bit about our um, successes and also our lessons learnt in Dorset's Heathland Heart. Um, so this project had um, a range of elements, um, including quite a substantial um, engagement and outreach program and volunteer monitoring. Um, but a substantial part of it was also the creation of microhabitats for bear species. So Dorset's very well known for its lovely heathlands um, and many of you may be familiar with the, um, the sad tale of loss, 85% loss um, over the last sort of, couple of centuries. Um, but that does mean that a lot of the remaining sites are um, in fact now in, in conservation hands. Um, there's two uh, large um, SACs, a lot of it is, is SSSI and of course there's the, uh, the newly created Purbeck Heaths NNR. And about 25 years ago or so, um, it was possible to start bringing grazing back onto the heathlands. It was recognised that um, one of the reasons that the Dorset heaths had lost a lot of species compared to say the new forest um, next door um, was the lack of grazing. Um, and in addition to the grazing, there's ongoing heathland management in terms of um, heather cutting and um, uh, rotational gorse cutting and, and tree and, and scrub management as well. Um, but despite all this really good management, um, it was uh, found that a lot of key species were actually still declining. So although the habitat was, um, what, what was left of the habitat was in apparently in good condition um, and doing well, we were actually still losing species. Um, when you come to think of it, it's perhaps not so surprising because traditional use of heathlands was much more than just grazing. Um, for example, there was, um, there was bracken cutting for, for, for livestock, there was heather cutting, it was used for thatch, um, gorse was used to, for um, bread ovens, um, some other things like um, some of the wet peaty areas were cut and then dried for fuel and of course there were a lot of uh, little 
um, borrow pits, sand pits, and also clay pits. And in fact, clay um, was quite a, a big, and still is, in fact, quite a big industry in the Purbeck Heaths. Um, and as you can see here, they weren't necessarily just small clay pits, um, but some substantial ones as well. And what all these various um, elements contributed, if you like, um, were these microhabitats, um, the bare ground and early successional habitats that Jim was just um, Jim was just talking about there. So I'd just like to rattle through um, some of the early successional habitats that we've been creating and restoring in Dorset's Heathland Heart over the last, uh, well, nearly four years now. Um, and I'm just going to talk about the first um, four there on this list. So dry sandy scrapes. Um, was perhaps our sort of first and foremost was our largest um, creator of, of bare ground. We've done about um, well well over 200 dry scrapes. Um, this is across eight sites and with six different landowners and these were all fairly big scale and they were all created with excavators or similar and although they were um, aimed at um, assemblages of species and um, particularly insects and reptiles we were actually targeting them at um, specific species and in this case it was the sand lizard, um, the heath tiger beetle, heath bee fly and also the mottled bee fly. So when we started we had quite a clear plan of what we thought we were going to do. We were going to create scrapes that were quite big, they were going to be five meters by 20 meters, um, they were going to be paired. The arisings were going to be used to create a bank on the northern edge and this would have a, a, a steep south facing aspect and then a shallower north northern um, slope um, really just for accessibility and if they were on a slope um, there would be a, a cliff cut either in the sides or um, at, at the back as you're facing it at the back on the you know the south facing edge um, and they were all as far as possible to be to be south facing they were paired um, really for legacy reasons so that um, they could be maintained but maintained on a rotation so that you wouldn't be for example rotivating up all of your bare ground in one go however it didn't work out like that in the end um, we found that we actually needed to take into account a lot of site specific factors. It was hardly surprising, I guess, um, but slope and aspect. Um, the substrates were much patchier than, than we'd have envisaged. Um, and th things like the presence of heritage features as well and access constraints and so on. And the other thing was that um, site managers um, preferences turned out to be quite a, um, a key contributor to um, influencing what we were doing. And creating bare ground isn't, isn't new. Um, for example, ARC were doing it, you know, a couple of decades ago at least, and although perhaps it was, was seen as a bit quirky at the time, a lot of other site managers have, have since seen that it actually it's, it works really well. And so the man site managers we were working with had their own opinions about whether it was best to, to use a blade to make a, a, a nice, flat, slightly compacted bit of bare ground, whether it was better to use an excavator and compact it that way, whether it was actually better to use the bucket of the excavator to sort of fluff up the sand, um, or whether in fact to take a different route and do something like um, turf stripping. Um, using um, specific technology for that. So in addition to that, um, we found there was quite a difference between the sites in terms of PR because the scrapes certainly initially um, can be quite, um, quite eye-catching um, and we found that our partners uh, varied really depending on their accountability to, to members um, and if they're a membership organisation they tended to be a lot more worried about what the public might think. Obviously we did some we did some engagement and we did some, some posters and um, various sort of talks and sessions and things um, but we ended up with a whole diversity of different shapes and sizes. Um, one of the things as well that we found was that the digger drivers they tended to really pride themselves on how how tidy their um, bare ground creation is um, and we found it quite hard to persuade them to perhaps be a little bit messier and with some in particular to, to um, you know appreciate the aesthetics of the site and so it took a little while to learn how to um, get the scrapes placed nicely in the in the landscape there's some viewable from space there which aren't my aren't my favorite scrapes and the one on the right um, was a clay scrape that um, I couldn't be on site and when I did turn up um, it was very sort of neat and tidy and straight and uh, luckily I got there in time to manage to sort of swing a curve in it um, but it did teach us that we really needed to work with the different contractors um, to try and you know develop their own style of um, slightly more natural messy looking scrapes um, and also that there was a lot more on-site supervision than we'd initially um, anticipated. So how did we do? Um, well just in terms of some of our key species we found for example that the heath tiger beetle um, seemed to respond really well to new scrapes you know within hours of a new scrape being um, created and also we were really pleased with um, sand lizard. Uh, we were 
it was suggested that in fact sand lizards might be a little slow to, to start using the scrapes and they'd need a year or two for them to settle down and, and weather a bit um, but actually we were finding test egg burrows um, within the second year um, so that was really pleasing with both these species clearly they were using the habitat and one would really hope that they were benefiting um, but we're not actually able to say whether there's a, a population increase um, as a consequence which kind of brings on to a wider discussion around monitoring which is so key um, and we did have some nice ad hoc records of some other species, other um, heathland rarities, such as the, um, we've got the heath potter wasp there and one of the sand, um, sand wasps, um, a muffle of pubescens, um, which were found um, uh, using the scrapes. Our monitoring was all done by volunteers and um, they weren't necessarily um, established entomologists. So we were doing single species uh, monitoring. And we did intend that, um, we were going to have a, a, a more substantial research project with um, Bournemouth University, in fact, but as it turned out, it, it didn't work out because while they weren't going to be looking at species level, they were able to look at, you know, the number of insects and perhaps, you know, perhaps different types um, using the scrapes, um, but they needed something to test, which was meant to be the um, size and shape. And in the end, we just had such a huge diversity of, of scrapes um, that it clearly wasn't going to work out as a student project. However, they're all mapped, they're all available, they're in a, a Bournemouth University data set, and we really hope um, that one day somebody might be able to, to make the most of that, um, that, that data set that's, that's ready and waiting um, in terms of the, the scrape locations when they were created and their size and shape and so on. So just to rattle through um, a couple of the other types of bare ground, um, clay pits were one of my favourite. Um, as I mentioned, the clay industry is quite a key feature across the Purbeck Heaths. In the end, we created 32 different clay features, and that was um, a combination of reprofiling existing clay pits, um, creating new scrapes, and also creating um, kind of cliffs where there was a, a bit more of a slope and we could actually create a kind of clay, clay cliff. Um, that was done both mechanically and, and by hand as well um, across a, a variety of sites. Results so far, again, we had some immediate results, which was um, super pleasing. This is um, the Perbeck Mason wasp, a beautiful thing. And again, it was using scrapes um, the very next season, actually. Um, it's a bit of a tricky one in that it seems to have a bit of a boom and bust population. And happily, it appears to be going through a, a boom phase at the moment. And what I'd like to say that our, our scrapes are instrumental in that. I don't think we can actually uh, re really claim that, but clearly they are using the habitat. Um, and we've got um, quite a few burrows that they're using as well, which is great. So one of the things that we looked at there was trying to place the scrapes so that they created stepping stones in between existing populations um, so that they could function more as metapopulations and support each other because at the moment they're quite isolated and this is a species um, which really doesn't um, disperse particularly widely. Um, we thought we'd got that got that um, covered but actually when we got out there um, with the excavators which obviously dig a lot deeper than our little hand um, hand spades um, it, we, we weren't able to get the information about the soil um, types to the right um, the right degree of definition really and um, so where we thought it was going to be clay it turned out to be sand and vice versa um, so there's a, a bit of work there to do um, to, to, to get some better base information to work with I think so um, another type of scrape was on wet heath, and this was meant to mimic the turf pairing that would have taken place, as I mentioned earlier, um, to create turfs to, to, to burn. Um, and we did this specifically for the marsh club moss and also the large celled flatwort. I'm not going to talk any more about the poor old large celled flatwort because, um, yeah, we've not seen it at all. And sadly, it looks like it's actually um, extinct in our area, which is a shame. However, we did a bit better with the marsh club moss. So we created a lot of these again, um, about 60 um, were created across um, four different sites. But in the end, we came to the conclusion that perhaps scrapes weren't quite the right approach um, or conventional scrapes weren't quite the right approach for this species. So we found um, it did pop up, which is very exciting in two new sites. They were both in Wareham Forest, but they weren't in the scrapes. They were adjacent to the scrapes quite clearly in the tracks that the excavator had made while getting into position to, to make the scrapes. Um, so based on that and some discussions with RSPB who were working on another site nearby, we went along to this other site and deliberately disturbed an existing population. And it was a very strong population, um, 3000 at least. Um, and basically we just drove up and down it in a tractor. 
And by the next year, um, there were 12,000 plants and that continued the following year as well. It went up to um, 13,000 plants. So clearly it worked to increase the population size. Um, and I think the reason that the scrapes weren't working is because this is a species that has an obligate fungal associate. This is some um, research that's just ongoing at the moment, actually. Um, and this fungal associate is found actually within the plant. It's not in the soil, but it's within the plant. But it's also within purple moorgrass and rushes. Um, so clearly, if, if the species is colonising, bare ground on its own is not going to be enough. It's going to have to be within reach, probably, of one of these other plants that are containing the, the fungal associate. The Species Recovery Trust had um, done quite a few scrapes, I think about 40. Um, and that's what our work was initially modelled on. Um, but they had about a one in one in 40 success rate. Um, and to date, none of our scrapes have actually, our conventional scrapes have um, have been colonised, except one where it's just sort of crept in from, from just on the edge. Um, so rutted tracks was the last um, one that I really wanted to talk about. And this one, um, I think it's my favourite because it's so it seems so unlikely. Um, there's a handful of species, things like yellow century and all seed and chaffweed, um, that are really specialists of wet, damp places on heathlands, seasonally wet, so wet in winter, drying out of it in the summer. And you get them in, for example, the New Forest, the Dorset Heaths, um, and down on the Lizard as well. And there's a couple that have become um, quite rare on the Dorset Heaths. So we went back to sites where they were just, just hanging on, or in fact hadn't been seen for quite a few number of years and tried to work out where the tracks had been and what we could do to, to resurrect those populations. So we ended up with um, five sites and we took a variety of, undertook a variety of work, including tree felling and some scrub clearance. Um, we actually used a sort of huge mechanical rake to, put, to pull out gorse roots and then basically just driving up and down to create ruts. And the importance of that is that um, there's standing water in winter, which then dries out in summer. And because we don't know exactly what the species needs, it's good to have a variety so that hopefully somewhere along the lines, you actually get the right um, degree of, of kind of dampness. It was highly focused and quite, quite tricky. We used old aerials to try and plot the maps, put them on a GPS, went out and staked them out on the ground, out actually on ground. Um, we dragged out a couple of retired wardens to tell us what they could remember about where they exactly where they'd seen it um, and used a lot of sort of detailed monitoring. And again, we were pleased that we were pretty successful with this. Um, on one site, which was a, um, a clay site, um, we found some penny royal. Um, it didn't show up the first year. And we'd had a lot of successes with um, a lot of our other scrapes. And we were wandering along with some of the volunteers and they were quite enthused by all these different successes and so I used it as an example that you know it doesn't always work because I would look you know we we tried for this for Penny Royal and we surveyed for it last year and it didn't pop up and then I looked down at my feet and, and there it was so we were really delighted that there are at least um, 40 plants and that population has maintained itself since then. Um, even more exciting for me is Yellow Century which is a tiny little yellow member of the gentian family. Um, we actually got enough data for a graph look at that um, so we had four sites here and as you can see um, on a couple of sites it had completely vanished, was only in the seed bank and then on a couple of other sites that were just very low numbers, I mean just literally one or two plants that were seen um, and overall we got up to about 200 plants and I should say that for the, this is a, a winter annual, uh, sorry a summer annual species um, that on a good site you will find hundreds and hundreds not thousands so these populations aren't, I wouldn't say they were robust but obviously they're a lot better than they were. Um, we weren't able to survey last year, but we have just nipped out and done our very first survey for this year. Most of the sites, it's raining so much, most of the sites are still underwater, but one isn't. Um, and that was the site near Godlingston, which went up from 60 a couple of years ago and it's going on up. It was over 250 this year. So that was really pleasing. So that worked really well for those species. And that just brings on to one, um, one last thought really, which is about what we're actually trying to conserve. Um, obviously these species were doing pretty well in the seed bank and quite clearly every once in a while they need that seed bank to be um, um, to be refreshed um, but I'm just slightly worried about our ongoing management for these sites because we don't have that many um, plants that are actually setting seed. 
the plants that are there are setting seed, but there's not many plants to set seed. So I am concerned that by just um, continuing to disturb them, we will actually just be depleting that seed bank. Um, so there's a few issues to think around there in terms of what we're actually trying to conserve and how best to do it. Um, and another issue that um, came up was compliance issues on tracks. Um, one was on a bridleway, um, and it, well, actually, it, the bride, it turned out not to be on a bridleway, but it's what people thought was a bridleway. So then we had to cut another place where people could get through because we were mushing up the track. Um, and on another site, we did, we did have concerns about sort of compliance issues there. And um, so all sorts of interesting things um, to think about. Um, we did quite a lot of other bits and pieces as well. So if there's anything else you'd, you'd like to know, do um, pop a note in the chat or I think I'm around for the, um, for the question session later. But I think I'll leave it there and just um, just give my thanks to all our partners in the on the Dorset Heaths and particularly the Purbeck Ecology Volunteers um, who've done sterling work and are continuing to do so in actually monitoring some of these populations. Thank you very much. Fantastic, Sophie. Thank you so much for that. Really great to see so much positive work going on and very impressed with the monitoring that you've been uh, able to undertake there just to check how each of these interventions is working. So uh, without further ado, I shall pass over to our next speaker, who is Pip Mountjoy from Natural England. And Pip's going to tell us a bit about the bare ground work that's being done under the Shifting Sands project uh, in Back from the Brink. Over to you, Pip. Hi, everyone. My name is Pip Mountjoy. I manage the Shifting Sands project, which is one of the larger integrated projects in Back from the Brink and we're based in Breckland, East Anglia. So I'm going to give you a short introduction to the project and a bit of context, and then I'm going to talk through a very small section of the work that we've done. Um, I haven't got much time today, so I've just chosen a few highlights. As with all of the projects you'll hear from today, we focus on early successional habitats, so primarily lowland, heathland and grassland habitats. Um, so I'm going to throw some stats at you to begin with just to highlight what it is about the Brex that makes it so important for wildlife. So it's not a large area, it's, it's a biogeographical region that spans Norfolk and Suffolk and a tiny little corner of Cambridgeshire. Um, but it's a really special place for a lot of our rarest species. So to throw some numbers at you, it is home to nearly 13,000 species. It's got 55 sites of special scientific interest or triple SIs. 28% of all UK priority species live in the Brex and 72 species are restricted to the Brex. So the Shifting Sands project has been incredibly ambitious and large and complicated. And the key focus has been on landscape scale conservation. So restoring and connecting fragmented lowland grass heath habitats um, to benefit a whole host of cross taxa species that need those early successional conditions, as loads of our Brex specialists do. So the project is split into four work streams, as you can see here. So um, lead organisations are shown in bold and all the partners are listed. And each work stream has been a huge collaborative effort. So there isn't time to tell you about everything that's been done and every intervention that we've trialled. Um, so I'm going to just focus mostly on the work that we do with rabbits. And then I'm going to choose some key examples as well of the, um, the works done by the rare plants and by the forest corridors work streams. So um, the habitat scale conservation stuff has been combined also with some more targeted plant reintroductions where necessary. Um, but I'll begin by sharing the habitat scale work. And as you'll have already heard today, I'm sure, um, very broadly, Maintaining and restoring early successional conditions can be broken down into keeping competitive vegetation under control, so grazing or mechanical intervention, um, and also ground disturbance. Those are the two key things that our species need. So I am going to focus on what we actually did, um, but you do need some context first. So rabbits are what we call a keystone species in the Brex. Um, their grazing and their burrowing has shaped the landscape for hundreds of years. They're a huge part of Brex history, both economically and ecologically. Um, 
and Warren has farmed rabbits in the Breck since medieval times. A lot of our heathland sites and a lot of our triple SIs are actually old Warrens. Their importance is encapsulated by this slide, um, which was put together by Phoebe Miles, the original project manager. So um, these two photographs are facing in different directions on the same site. And it shows an area with high rabbit density and an area with low rabbit density. So the micro habitats and the sward complexity on the left is actually great news for a lot of Brex plants and invertebrates, um, as well as reptiles and, and ground nesting birds and things that like bare ground mosaics. So the problem is that rabbit numbers are declining massively, um, globally and nationally, due to a combination of lots of things, but mainly due to viruses. So there is a, a rabbit pandemic going on at the moment. And there has been for at least well, since the 90s, but really since the 50s, there's there's three viruses at the moment all kind of working in conjunction and it's, it's causing a lot of trouble for rabbits. So as a result of that, um, what we've seen is early successional habitats becoming overgrown and lost in the Brex. Um, and rabbits are actually now classified as an endangered species in their native region of the Iberian Peninsula. There's been work there on reintroductions and encouraging rabbits, um, but there's not been very much done in the UK where historically they've been seen as a pest. Shifting Sands has built on the work previously done by the University of East Anglia. So uh, we were advised by Professor Diana Bell using rabbit behavioural expertise to trial different habitat management methods to encourage rabbits to spread and to breed with the aim of building resilience in declining populations on key sites. So it's, a, it's unfortunately a little early to comment on population changes. So our data is currently being analysed. I thought I would have it by today, but unfortunately just missed it. So um, I actually think that we're unlikely to see any significant impacts on populations within the time frame of the project. Um, I think the value of this work is in identifying different methods that landowners can use to facilitate future recovery. So, um, so what we're doing is producing a, a toolkit, a landowner advice toolkit that's going to outline different habitat management op options. Um, like I say, yeah, the stats are still being done on the success of each method, but I can give you a bit of an overview here on, on what we trialled and the publicly available landowner advice toolkit is going to be published next month. Um, in August. So the photo you can see here is the construction of turf scrapes. Um, so we did turf scrapes and banks, which are essentially small versions of the warrens that ancient warreners used to construct. Um, so the ground is scraped to create bare earth. Um, the arisings are used to create a bank. Landowners who still do have rabbits on their land will know that they, they tend to prefer burrowing into a slope. So there's there's less chance of flooding and a south facing slope is nice and warm. Um, it's easier to burrow into a, a sort of flat edge than it is to burrow straight down. Um, a recurring challenge throughout the project is that mechanical ground disturbance is extremely complex in this region um, due to its rich history. So there's a lot of sensitive archaeology and there's a lot of unexploded ordnance. And this meant that the design for the turf strips had to be modified quite a lot. And if anything, I think this kind of strengthens our argument that we, we really can't replicate what rabbits do naturally. Um, so it's not possible yet to say whether this is statistically supported, but from, from the basic observations, the results were hugely variable. So some sites had several burrows in the turf strips and banks, some had none. All sites with livestock had very high interactions of uh, livestock and groundwork. They absolutely love the banks which could be quite a big factor in discouraging use by rabbits um, or in the number of burrows that were collapsed after forming, which happened quite often. Um, so we did actually try excluding some livestock to see if that ex increased the success rate, but unfortunately it was very disrupted by COVID restrictions. Um, and then when we finally did get back on site, the rate of vegetation growth was just unsustainably high for us to be able to recommend that. So, um, so that was one of our methods, creating 42 banks across five sites. The second habitat management method is brush piles. So creating areas 
of refuge where rabbits can shelter from predators and where they can burrow. So this photo is one of our messier brush piles, but um, you can see if you look closely that there's at least two burrows that are formed in there. Um, this is from work that we did on Elfton Estate where they've had really good results. Again, not possible to say for sure yet, but these seem to be more consistently successful. So around over 20% to 30% of them contained active warrens by the end, um, and 70% of them had signs of rabbit activity and evidence of use. So they're a really easy and cheap option for landowners who will likely be felling brush anyway as part of their heathland management plans. So different designs and details are going to be outlined in the advice toolkit along with other results like, um, like the most reliable monitoring methods or the results of projects by UEA master students like scent marking trials to encourage burrowing. So, um, so that very roughly outlines the habitat management works that we did for rabbits. Originally, there were plans for reintroductions and translocations, which weren't possible and it's not really a viable practice overall. So we'll explore that a little bit more in the toolkit as well. So onto the plant work stream, which is led by Plant Life. Um, they've done so much incredible work, it is not possible to cover it all. Um, in terms of habitat management for bare ground, in the Brex, it's quite similar methods to those that are seen in other projects. So um, areas are turf stripped to leave bare ground that can then either be naturally colonised by those less competitive, rarer plant species, or they can act as receptor sites for reintroductions. So turf stripping in the Brex is, um, is done on quite huge scales generally. Some of our plant works were done mechanically using diggers, um, some of them were done using groups of volunteers, as you can see in this picture, um, hand stripping turf away. One interesting method was to reinstate old plough lines. Um, so this site is actually a heathland site where ploughs would work in the field all day and then they would come and plough a line through the field here because the sandy and the flinty soils would clean the blades after a day's work. Um, and that actually creates ideal conditions for quite a lot of our plants. Um, sort of semi-regular disturbance. So those plough lines contain some of our really, really rare species, um, like prostrate perennial narwhal, which you can see on the right here, which is actually globally restricted to the Brex. So there's only three native sites on Earth, all in Breckland. Um, and plant life have done perennial narwhal reintroductions and translocations as part of the project to reinforce those native populations. Um, and to reintroduce them to areas where they've disappeared. So those have actually been really successful and they're all looking pretty happy and healthy, which is great. And those plants were reared at home by, by our Plant Life Project staff. Um, and on the left there, you can see field wormwood as well, which is another one of our rare Brex plants. Um, they've been reintroduced by the project across a range of sites, and that's to benefit both the plant and the associated wormwood moonshiner beetle. So both are, both are restricted to the Brex. Um, and those locations for the reintroductions of field worm would vary from those turf stripped areas on the heathland sites um, to industrial estates, to a car park where regular human disturbance could maintain those early successional conditions. Um, and in total, there were six areas turf stripped and reintroductions were done at nine sites as well as a load of other incredible work to change management regimes and designate new areas and do genetic sequencing and soil sampling and intensive monitoring of Breck species by the Breckland Flora Group. And finally, I'm going to tell you about our forest corridors work. So this work was led by Forestry England, um, where they have widened forest rides within Breckland Forest. So 4.5 kilometres or around 11 hectares of rides have been widened to restore a mosaic of, of open habitat within the forest. Um, so the archaeology and the unexploded ordnance issues that I mentioned previously were particularly challenging in the forest and, and this has meant that Forestry England have had to come up with some really innovative ground disturbance methods. So I think this is actually something that's quite unique to the Brex in that not only do we widen the forest corridors but we also disturb the ground as, as a really key condition for a lot of our species. 
Um, and this has been done and will continue to be done using a patchwork rotation of, of rotivation, mulching and disking. So I think generally the, the method would be stump removal and deep ploughing, um, but that's not possible. So out of necessity more than anything, they'll be trialling some exciting new methods. Initial species results have actually been really, really good. Um, and the above photo you can see is from summer 2020, a few months after the wides were widened. Um, and you can see the complex mosaic structure of the vegetation there really clearly. So rides from previous years have actually been monitored by the project in order to inform how we want to manage these ones going forwards. And they've shown really positive results for a lot of our species, particularly butterflies and moths. So lunar yellow underwing, grayling, dingy skipper. So that's it. That's um, a very brief overview of what the Shifting Sands project has been up to and some of our different bare ground management methods that we've trialled. Um, thanks very much. And I will be around at the end of the day for the Q&A session if anyone's got any questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Pip. And uh, really interesting to hear about how you've overcome the various uh, challenges uh, to, to create some fantastic new habitat there in the Brex. So I will, without further ado, hand over to Andrew Hampson, who's going to be talking a bit about uh, recovery of species, uh, depending on bare ground, in the Gems in the Dunes project up on the Sefton coast. So over to Andrew. Hi. My name is Andrew and I am the project officer on the Gems in the Dunes project. Uh, Gems in the Dunes is led by Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Trust and is focused on the sand dunes of the Sefton coast, specifically the dune specialist species that thrive here, including the Natterjack toad, sand lizard, northern dune tiger beetle, petalwort and sea bryum. Bare ground is an important characteristic of a sand dune habitat providing the perfect conditions for a wide range of pioneer flora and fauna, whether that is petalwort or sea biom colonising areas of damp bare sand surrounding dune slacks, or sand lizards basking, burrowing and laying eggs on south facing slopes. Unfortunately, and perhaps surprisingly, sand is in short supply on the sand dunes of the Sefton coast and recent studies suggest up to 80% of the area of bare sand has been lost since the 1940s. In that time, we have seen drastic declines in the distribution and abundance of some of our most specialist species. The population of Natterjack toads has declined by 70% since the 1970s. Sand lizard numbers have fallen from around 10,000 adults in the early 1900s to around 500 adults today and petalwort populations have gone from tens of thousands of individual plants along the coast 30 years ago to just around 2,000 today and that number has actually fallen every year during the project. A key aim of the project was to restore bare ground habitat for these species and many other specialists that would likely benefit too. Bare ground was created in a number of ways as a result of scrub removal, alongside slack rejuvenation and also targeted sand patch creation on southerly facing slopes. Throughout the project, a range of techniques were trialled for the first time on the coast on a large scale with contractors, but also on a much smaller scale using volunteers too. Japanese rose or Rosa rugosa is an invasive non-native species of plant that thrives in sand dune habitats. So much so that large stands of the plant continue to increase in size up to 20% a year. It has become a serious problem on the Sefton coast and large areas of sand dune habitat have been lost as it encroaches, crowding out less dominant species of plant and creating a monoculture which then becomes unsuitable for the native fauna too. Techniques for dealing with Japanese rose in the past have often involved repeated cutting and spraying with a herbicide but this is often costly and time consuming and there is a desire to move away from relying on herbicides in the longer term. Instead, 
The project looked to clear areas of Japanese rose using an excavator to dig up and then bury the plants, including its root systems. Work took place through the winter months, so one of the greatest challenges was locating and marking the sites to be cleared, as this often involves searching for brown twigs in a sea of brown grass. Once the sites were marked, an excavator removed the plant along with the top metre or so of sand in an attempt to remove as many roots as possible. The spoil was then piled to one side as the excavator dug down at least a further two metres. The hole was then filled with the plant and its root before being topped with the clean sand two metres in depth. And this was repeated for every patch of Japanese rose. Following the work, patches were monitored for regrowth and it was observed that initial revegetation took place quite quickly. Thistles, rose bay willow herb and dewberry were the main culprits. Some small amounts of Japanese rose appeared too, likely from fragments of root that weren't buried deep enough. And these were hand dug where possible and occasionally uh, treated with herbicide too. Despite this, bare sand remained in many of the patches for over two years. And I think on a site with more public disturbance, bare sand would remain for longer. The patches were quickly colonised by northern June tiger beetles in their first year. Most patches had a handful of individuals, although larger patches saw considerably more, dozens in some instances. No mating or egg laying was observed, although. As this is a military site, we were confined to very short periods of time for surveys. I would say it was quite likely that the patches would have been used for egg laying at some point. The patches were less suitable for sand lizards though, and that was due to the lack of a varied topography. And it said the surrounding area was a flat plateau of sand dune. There was a single record of a lizard taken on one of the sand patches, but this was most likely a common lizard, although it was never identified. Sand lizards are more likely to have benefited from sand patch creation taking place on southerly facing dune slates. Occasionally with heavy machinery, but more often uh, by volunteers using hand tools. Sites were chosen depending on whether there were extant sand lizard populations present. And this typically took place on isolated inland sites in an attempt to increase egg laying opportunities, which may influ influence population size and range. The exact locations of sand patches was determined by slope aspects and gradients, surrounding vegetation structure and the potential for shading. The ideal sand patch would be located on a southerly facing slope, surrounded by a mixed vegetation structure, which would include tussocky vegetation, such as marram grass and bramble, and unlikely to be shaded by tall trees or buildings. Sand patches were a minimum of one metre by two metres in size to ensure that they didn't quickly revegetate. And it was thought that lots of smaller sand patches were favoured to a few larger ones, as sand lizards only ever use the very edge of the patches closest to vegetation to lay their eggs. Because of this, it was important not to destroy areas of good vegetation cover around the edges of the patch too, and that's why volunteers were more beneficial as they were able to work more sensitively. Existing sand patches were renovated every year between April and May, after all the lizards were likely to have emerged from hibernation, but before egg laying would have commenced. New sand patches were created after this from June until September, and during this time we would avoid working on all areas of bare sand, in, just in case eggs had been laid uh, within it, and then stopping works as soon as adults begin hibernating again. It's difficult to measure the success of sand patch creation. A potential technique could be to search for spent egg cases the following year during rejuvenation work. However, the egg cases can be quite small and look like broken fragments of sea or snail shells and easily missed. Occasionally, you can be quite lucky, and this male adult sand lizard quickly appeared on a sand patch that had been dug minutes earlier, taking advantage of the fresh bare sand for a quick bask. Early successional dune slacks are vital habitat for specialist species such as natterjack toads, petalwort and sea brown. But natural successional change taking place at an increased rate due to climate change and a lack of grazing animals means these habitats are quickly disappearing. 
For centuries, a lack of extensive vegetation cover meant the dunes were incredibly mobile, and these features would have formed naturally on a more regular basis than we see today. In fact, the majority of new dune slacks formed in the past 60 years were created as a result of sand extraction for glass making and construction. And since this process was stopped, dune slacks are now only created when funding becomes available to land managers. The vast majority of dune slacks along the coast have matured and are now surrounded by scrub and dense rank grasses and swamped by emergent vegetation, all providing really poor conditions for nettlejack toads to breed in and for brimes and petalwort to colonise the surrounding areas. The project looked to reverse the changes that have taken place by using excavators to strip scrub and vegetation surrounding the slacks to create a more open habitat of damp bare sand, ideal conditions for specialist bryophytes to colonise, such as sea bryum and petalwort. Vegetation was removed from within the dune slacks too, being careful not to deepen the slack in the process and on occasion infilling with bare sand to create a flat, shallow bottom with gently sloping sides. Where possible, the, the removed scrub and vegetation was buried in a similar way mentioned early with the Japanese rose to create additional bare ground habitat nearby. One issue that hampered the work was extreme flooding throughout the winter months. When the work was originally scheduled to take place, water levels were too high, which made reprofiling the pools impossible. Fortunately, we were able to delay the work until in the work until early autumn when it was much drier. In addition to entire pools being rejuvenated, some small hand dug scrapes were created around former petalwork colonies as a trial to see whether plants would recolonize following an absence. The top layer of organic matter down to a layer of bare sand was removed in a number of patches no more than one square meter, and that was using mattocks and spades with volunteers. The patches were monitored regularly, and the following winter, individual thalli were recorded in a number of the scrapes. It is likely these thalli generated from spores that had been do dormant beneath the surface, becoming active as conditions became suitable again. Before future works take place, core sampling around former colonies of petalwort and also sea bryum would help establish where spores might be located in the soil horizons dictating the depth at which the surface should then be scraped during habitat management work. Looking back at what went well and what didn't, we think a good mixture of large scale capital works and small scale volunteer work was ideal. Volunteers were able to come in and carry out work more sensitively compared to contractors. For example, using hand tools to create the perfect sand patch without trampling surrounding vegetation whereas excavators would, would come in and trash surrounding vegetation due to their large size. Contractors were able to improve large areas of habitat that would have been overwhelming for volunteer groups and would have taken too much time. Fortunately, the contractors employed along the coast have been involved in work previously that was very similar and so had a great level of expertise, meaning work was carried out to a high standard. Looking at what could have worked better, the sites chosen for capital works didn't always completely fit with some of our target species. And for example, creating suitable habitat for the bryophytes, they were too geographically isolated from these sites to ever colonize them naturally and would have benefited from translocations. The areas where the bryophytes were still present and where habitat management was needed, unfortunately couldn't be included in the capital works due to other funding already being in place. This is why we carried out some small scale volunteer work on these areas instead. Finally, there is a definite need going forward to ensure that the benefits of habitat management work carried out are long lasting. Unfortunately, land managers often lack the resources to maintain perfect habitat conditions over a long period of time. On sand dune systems, we would advise looking to create large self-sustaining features that would continue to create and maintain those ideal habitat conditions. One such example is creating notches in the dunes in the dunes to encourage wind erosion and the movement of bare sand, potentially creating dune slacks in the process. More intense grazing regimes in selected areas would also benefit the habitat and species and would be more cost and time effective for land managers. 
thank you very much for listening and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, great to see the results of the work up on Sefton Coast there and the reflections on what's worked well and uh, what could be improved in future. Really useful learning points for, um, for projects uh, yet to come there. Fantastic. So we'll move on to the next speaker. Uh, and that's Jane Sears from the RSPB. And Jane's going to talk to us about field crickets. So over to you, Jane. In this talk, I'll describe some of the work we've done to create suitable habitat for one of our most threatened species of cricket. The field cricket was never common in, in the UK, being confined to grassy heathlands in southeast England. It has been lost from many sites due to habitat change, including the planting of conifers and fragmentation, to which it's particularly vulnerable as it doesn't fly. In the 1980s, it was down to only one site in West Sussex and numbered around 100 individuals. Since then, thanks to a lot of effort by many organisations to restore suitable habitat and reintroduce it, field crickets have been brought back from the brink of extinction in England. The Back from the Brink project aimed to build on the previous work to increase the resilience of the populations. We wanted to make one of the previously introduced populations at RSPB's Farnham Heath Reserve more robust by expanding it into another area of restored habitat there. We also aim to join up two of the populations in West Sussex through habitat restoration and translocation at RSPB's Paul Brooks Reserve. Field crickets love a bit of warmth and in England they need sandy bare ground to provide this. Their ideal is a mosaic of bare ground and grassy heath with a mixture of heather and millennia grass and about 20 to 50% bare ground like the habitat in the right hand photo. They dig their burrows in the sandy soil and create little platforms on the bare ground outside their burrows to warm up on and to call from. They also lay their eggs in the bare ground and they feed on the roots and shoots of grass. Prior to RSPB's ownership, the heathland at Farnham Heath and Pulbra Brooks had been planted up with non-native conifers. Over the last two decades, we've restored the heathland at Farnham Heath, but at Pulbra Brooks, dense birch, bramble and bracken took hold once the trees were felled. This is what the heath looked like in 2017 at the start of the Back from the Brink project. Through Back from the Brink, we've used a variety of methods to restore the bare ground at Pulbra Brooks, from mechanical scraping to remove roots and mulch to volunteer groups pulling up young birch using tree poppers. These are the yellow tools in the right hand photo and they help lever the roots out of the ground. An amazing 385 volunteers have helped with this project and we're very grateful to them all. All of this effort has helped produce a good mosaic of habitat on the heathland at Pulver Brooks, seen here in September of last year. We're maintaining it by grazing it with Highland cattle during the autumn and winter. They browse the young birch and they keep areas bare by breaking up the ground with their hooves. At Farnham Heath, to maintain the suitable habitat, we've mown wiggly heather strips and created bare ground scrapes, like the one in the foreground of this picture. Viewed from above, they make the heath look a little like a game of snakes and ladders. Woodlark, reptiles and rare mining bees all benefit from this habitat management. Through this work, we've maintained around 100 hectares of heathland in suitable condition and created an additional 10 hectares. That's 10 football pitches worth. This has enabled us to translocate field crickets at both reserves. And in 2020, we were delighted to have proof that they had bred at both sites. We are very grateful to all the funders for Back from the Brink and to the National Lottery players for their continued support. Thank you. 
Thank you for that, Jane. Great to hear uh, success uh, so quickly there in the field cricket project. Um, so now uh, for the last speaker in this session, uh, I'm going to hand over in a second to Alastair, but first I'll just remind everybody watching, uh, please do enter any questions you might have, uh, which we will follow up in the last bit of this session. We've got about 15 minutes, I think, set aside for questions, so do pop those in if you wish. But I will now hand over to Alastair Morley from Plant Life to talk about an exciting new project um, that will hopefully do wonders for all of these species that depend on, depend on bare ground. Over to you, Alistair. Thanks very much. Um, and yeah, fascinating talk so far. This one's slightly different in so much as this is not a direct back from the brink project, but it's a project that's been running really um, encouraged by, in parallel with, and informed by a lot of the work that back, of the, back, from, back from the brink has been involved with. Um, uh, you'll see it's focused on Dorset, Hampshire and Isle of Wight um, and we called it Creating Spaces, all about um, the future for bare ground and how we might go about planning um, how we manage and in incorporate bare ground. I know it's usually traditional that you thank all of the people at the end of a talk, but I'm very aware that I'm here as a proxy for some incredible brains and, and involvement that have been involved with this project over the last two or three years. Um, particularly Andy Byfield, um, who I work very closely with, but Andrew Whitehouse, um, several staff from, from Natural England, including Dee Stevens, um, and people like Andy Brown, Tim Wilkins, David Heber, and many, many others. So I thought it was important that everybody realizes that um, the, the work that, that, that I'm gonna talk about is, uh, is, is basically the product of an awful lot of other brains other than mine. Um, so what, what this project really was about was, was trying to think how we might plan um, uh, the provision of bare ground across an area, in this case Dorset, Hampshire and Isle of Wight. Why, why that area? Well, because Dee Stevens contacted Plant Life and others uh, two or three years or so ago looking to see how um, any might maximise uh, species diversity across that area and this is the sort of approach that we looked at and have taken. So what we've what we've done, and, and, and as I say, I'll reiterate that whenever I say we, I mean other people than me. Um, but what we did was across the three counties, we identified priority species that, that were dependent in one form or other on bare ground or early successional habitat. So we've got, you know, some species, those facultative species that can kind of get along most of the time with a bit of grazing and their populations do okay, but really what they need is some serious disturbance every now and then to get the populations up. And those obligate species who really do need bare ground throughout their life, their life sort of series um, and, and are completely dependent on it. So we, we looked and, and we looked across, um, although this was led in some ways or, or managed quite a lot by Plant Life along with, with Andrew Whitehouse from Bug Life and, and Dee, um, we did look across taxa. Um, so this wasn't just plants, um, I was looking multi-taxa and we, we identified um, around about 100, 141 priority species that, that were really very dependent across that, that piece of geography on bare ground and early successional habitat. And, and for those, obviously you can look at those species and you can kind of assign them to a sort of type of bare ground. There are lots and lots of sorts of bare ground and we've been hearing that I think from quite a lot of the talks uh, this afternoon. Uh, but you can tend to uh, assign species to uh, particular kinds, you know, the, the examples I've given here are seasonally inundated peat or chalky and sandy yeah. arable fallows, that sort of thing. Um, so we, we, we did that um, and then having done that, we, we, we looked across taxa um, and you realise that, that across the taxa that, uh, there's, there's groups of species that require or, or, or share common traits or require common sorts of management and, and habitats. Um, and by looking across all of those taxa, and I should I, I, I should emphasise that the uh, the three slides here don't represent an assemblage. I don't think Glanville Fritillary and Juniper go particularly closely together, but there you go. Um, uh, but we we look to identify assemblages of species that were dependent on particular kinds of bare ground and or early successional habitat, and sort of apply those those assemblages across those types of bare ground and, and for this area in particular we identified 10 broad species assemblages that were associated with specific 
bare ground habitats and you can see them listed there um, a species open slow succession or chalk and grassland or sphagnum bogs and transition mires muddy pond margins and the rest and so we've basically taken the the species that we'd uh, identified across uh, those three counties uh, and and grouped them across these uh, these ten uh, what we might call micro habitats or early succession or bare ground habitats so having done that um, we, we had uh, identified a group of species and we'd identified uh, we put them into assemblages so for each of those assemblages we've we've mapped um, the distribution um, of those of those species across the, the three counties of Dorset, Hampshire and Isle of Wight and you can see an example map here um, so there there is and I'll refer to this at the end of the talk as well there's a very very detailed report which has been fairly widely circulated and been published by NE um, and we're very keen to, to to get that out to as many people as possible and that report includes all of the maps and the details and the specifications that I'm going to refer to in the, in, in the talk this afternoon but so there is a map um, a distribution map for those three counties of the uh, bare ground uh, or, or the species associated in this case with with all of those 10 assemblages that we identified across that area um, and here's another example alongside that this is obviously a much smaller map you can't really see but this is the species of muddy pond margins um, so we've identified in the report the sort of key species in this case um, uh, brown gallon gale pillwort fairy shrimp tadpole shrimp and others um, done a little pen portrait for the for the region of, of um, uh, just to give a little bit of context for that um, and that's that's an output that's, that's been produced um, through this this process over the last couple of years um, so having done that we had maps that uh, were, were extremely useful um, uh, sort of illuminating to, to look across at the distribution of some of these species currently um, and, and obviously once you've done that you can look for focuses of assemblages or, or hotspots um, aggregations of those threatened species um, uh, looking potentially to be able to sort of maximize your impact on the ground with work you might do uh, help focus uh, project work down and ideas for the future and also to in ensure that when other management is being done or agricultural, agricultural environment schemes are being developed information is out there that, that people are sort of aware of the importance of particular areas within in, the, in this case this area so that's another output that was produced and from uh, from that hotspot mapping we were then able to identify opportunities is what we'd call them here for potentially for working um, on, a, on a whole range of, of, of species and uh, providing different kinds of, uh, of of management appropriate to the, the species assemblage depending on the on the bare ground um, and I thought it was really interesting what Sophie was saying earlier on uh, this afternoon about the sort of the, the, the micro variations as well across sites so I think one of the dangers of, of, of mapping is that it does make life look an awful lot simpler than it is on the ground when you do it but on the other hand I think it's a powerful tool to be able to sort of start to look um, at analysing the opportunities that might be available for us and and also uh, just encouraging us all I think as land managers to think much more directly about including the provision of bare ground and and, uh, and early successional habitat in all of our works on all of our sites so there's a place I think for for this pretty much everywhere um, in, incredibly important and we're hoping that the sort of information that we've produced in this report specifically for this area will make that process an awful lot easier for land managers who are often stressed and, pu and are pushed in terms of sort of delivering for their sites and perhaps aren't always able to sort of go back to first principles to, to do this sort of work so having having looked at identifying potential area-based opportunities we've also done a, a lot of mapping for all of those areas looking very much at um, very detailed site-specific maps um, and again so uh, identifying uh, opportunities for uh, for the provision if you like of um, particular types if you like of bare ground and early successional habitat across at, at a site level um, and there are we, we've a great number of these sort of site areas 
across Dorset, Hampshire and Isle of Wight. And we hope very much that this will provide a really uh, powerful resource for people managing the areas here just to sort of think about the provision of early successional habitat in, in, in their ongoing management and the opportunities as well. Um, we, you know, we, I think we have heard a little bit this afternoon that it is, it, it, this is not always easy. There's sometimes resistance to pro providing bare, bare ground. Um, any change sometimes is difficult for local communities. Um, and, and it often can be a bit messy when you're doing it, as I think we all, we all know. Um, so we have to, I think, recognize that there are uh, pressures that, that, that mitigate against doing this sort of work. And our hope is that, that providing this sort of summary and the opportunity mapping um, is really going to encourage us all, as I say, to think more about this and take up opportunities where we can. Um, so we, we, we carried on from that process and rather um, and, and alongside um, quite considerable consultation across the area, although we will undoubtedly have missed a lot of people. My apologies to those that we weren't able to get to and talk to directly. We've also within the report identified potential um, specific projects for particular clusters and groups and even started to think about the scale of cost that might be involved in trying to deliver some of that work. Um, so this is very much done uh, as, as, as a sort of uh, um, as a blank sheet of paper exercise for people to sort of uh, use and comment on uh, and and uh, develop more as, as they see fit. Um, but there are around about 20 potential actions uh, that have been identified um, through the people that have worked on this pro project over the last couple of years. Um, and we're very much hopeful that some of those will, will be taken up. Um, not all of this work needs to be um, uh, defined project-led operations. In some cases, that is the right way to go. In other cases, it's simply about taking opportunity within existing site management to improve the provision of, of bare ground and, and early successional sort of habitats. Um, so uh, this is very different from the, the previous projects that we've heard about today in so much it wasn't a direct delivery project. This was a, a, a think piece, if you like, trying to work out what a sensible process might, might be to identify where we can provide uh, most uh, uh, advantage, if you like, and be most cost effective in terms of delivering background and early successional habitat. Um, I, I could have talked quite a lot about um, the, the, the sort of scene setting as well. The report that we've done does all of that, but but, but Jim and others I knew would do a much better um, job than me uh, this afternoon in doing that. But the report I think does um, uh, provide a really coherent sort of picture as to why this is important, um, reiterated by the, by the speakers today. Um, and it, it does provide that that rationale that in this case the species and assemblage lists very specifically for Dorset, Hampshire and Isle of Wight, uh, the detailed maps um, and the ideas for the future. Uh, we hope it will be used very much as a sort of, uh, not as a blueprint, but as a, as a sort of something that spurs people's views and thoughts and, 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 and also as a resource um, because there has you know, considerable mapping of, of species records uh, for the last 20, 25 years in, within the report. Um, it's already helped. Um, I know that it has been used um, directly to work in several places, contributed in several places in Dorset and in Hampshire actually, um, uh, uh, sort of to inform management plans and supporting bids. Um, we hope that will continue and very much want our, anybody who, who is not aware of the report or would like copies of it, very, very happy to provide that. Um, it's been published by any and I'm very happy to sort of share copies with, with, with anybody who'd like to like to see the detail of it. Um, and it also has uh, been part of the sort of national level work that's going on at the moment, looking at whether the, the you know, answering that question as to whether the habitat based nature recovery networks can deliver across the board for species. Um, and if not, then which species might uh, fall through the cracks and how we should mitigate that and how we can like, plan, prioritize and make sure that we've got sufficient resources um, allocated to those species. Um, so I, I think that's that's been successful um, and I hope that that discussion will carry on. Um, and in, in addition, um, we have, or Dee Stevens from, from ENI, who's sadly left ENI now, but has left this as a legacy, um, 
have secured funding um, to begin some implementation work on some of the, the project ideas that we had on three areas in, 20, in, in the current financial year, um, hopefully about to start. So it, it has already spawned some direct work, which ha will happen over the sort of six, next six or eight months, um, both um, on the Isle of Portland in, in central Dorset and, and at Martin Down. Um, so, uh, Slightly different talk from those earlier on the Saturday, which we were talking very much about getting stuff done on the ground. This is very much more the theoretical side of things and how we might plan. But I'm, I'm hoping this potentially parts of this model and what we've done here might be useful in other areas and, and, and people looking at how they might prioritise and ensure that we do give bare ground and early successional habitat creation and maintenance the sort of priority that it really does uh, really does deserve. And, and just before I finish, I would sort of say that, you know, that the, the talks that we've heard today and also my experience of, of, of lots and lots of work that's going on right across the UK, so often what we're talking about when we're talking about um, habitat conservation and nature conservation work is in providing those early successional habitats, knocking succession back and providing bare ground. I think it's you know one of the most fundamental um, building blocks that we have to a large extent lost in many areas and, and needs that very, very high priority to, to re-establish. So um, thank you very much for listening and I will be around for the, for the questions and answers if uh, anybody has further questions. Thank you. Brilliant, Alistair. Thank you. Really fascinating project there. And and actually, um, just moving into the Q&As, uh, one of the first ones I, I think is for you. But I'll just let everybody watching at home know that we, we now have all the speakers um, uh, ready to answer the questions, aside from uh, Andrew Hampson, who couldn't be here today. But I'm uh, happy to try to take any questions on the uh, talk that he gave about gems in the dunes. So looking through the questions that have been submitted, one of the first ones uh, I just direct towards Alistair, which was, is there a link that you could post to the report on the work that you've just done? Or, or maybe just, is there a place on Plant Life's website where it's available? Um, I, I, uh, there isn't currently, the, well, there is a place on Plant Life's website that's available and I, I can I can share that with people. Um, perhaps I can find a way through the Back From Brink sort of uh, partnership to make sure that, that somebody, that, that there's a link directly available to that for, for anybody who wants that. So I will, as soon as we're finished here, I'll make make sure that's available for everybody. Great. Thank, thank you for that, Alistair. Uh, so looking at the other questions we've got um ba, 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 ba. let's see uh there was one i think was for pip something about uh rabbits so question from howard do rabbits have preferences for where they build their warrens notice these artificial warrens are in the middle of fields do you have any thoughts on that pip yeah so um so they certainly do have preferences and there's a few different factors there. So um, soil type is quite important. They like dry, burrowable substrate. So the sandy soils of the brecks are pretty ideal. Um, we know that they prefer burrowing into a slope rather than burrowing directly downwards. So basically, whatever makes it less energetically costly and makes life easier for them. Um, and they also like having some vegetation cover. So you'll find them beneath gorse bushes or beneath fence lines quite often which is kind of the logic behind our brash pile um, method in that it creates some of that cover in, in habitats where they're otherwise extremely open and exposed. Um, so we've actually measured a few things like ground penetrability and proximity to nearest active warrens, which is being analysed against plot success. So we can use that to inform the ideal placement of works in our toolkit. Um, but in terms of the placement of our plots, they vary. They're not all in the centre of fields on purpose. Um, the placement was informed by teat active warrens so we we did a we mapped all of the warrens before we started and we've done that annually since um and there were placed to avoid things like areas that already contained rare plants or ancient ant hills or sensitive archaeology or other important designated features so there's a load of factors in plot placement there brilliant thanks for that pip uh, i hope that's uh, answered your query howard uh, we've got another question here from uh, Kathy Meakin, who asks, and, and I think I'll direct this towards Sophie, if I may. 
Um, any hints and tips to a to reduce sharp edges and corners of being an excavator and how long until the scrapes look more natural? Oh yeah, that's a great question. So sharp edges, you just need to get the right operator, probably with a smaller bit of kit than, than they want to, to bring on because obviously if they've got a good, big bit of kit, they can do it really quickly. Um, but with a smaller one, I think you've got a little bit more flexibility um, and you're, going, you're not gonna have those sort of great chunks taken out. Um, and you just need to talk to them really because they, you know, it's amazing. I couldn't believe watching them, the skill with which they operate these, you know, really chunky bits of metal. Um, in terms of the time taken, it that depends a lot on the substrate and the weather. So, you know, a sandy scrape um, with nice soft edges can look natural you know just after a couple of couple of rainstorms really was there another part to that question was that it um i think it was how long does it sorry there was i was trying to find it again oh sorry uh, it's gone uh, it's gone from my list <laughs> yeah, <laughs> i think i think right. you answered it actually sophie don't worry great yeah uh, that's fantastic so uh next question let's see we've got a few popping up here um so Nicola Hutchinson asks, what have we learned about why this level of bare ground creation stroke management wasn't or isn't automatically undertaken by land managers? Um, I will direct that towards um, Jane. Is that okay, Jane? <laughs> I think we could all have a go at that, but do you want to have a start? Um Yes, okay. Um, well, I was lucky enough for the Back from the Brink project to be working on RSPB reserves where we have been undertaking uh, bare ground creation for many years. But um, I, thinking about other parts of the field cricket range, um, I think um, it's very variable between sites. I mean, some of the sites are kept open to um, public access. And as Sophie pointed out, you know, tracks and paths actually do create bare ground. I would say fewer people are actually creating deliberate scrapes. Um, possibly, I'm not sure that you can actually get much agri-environment money for that. I think it's more um, when we have got funding opportunities like Back from the Brink. And in fact, um, funding opportunities often come along like London buses and you end up with several in one go. And we've, we've had another um, heritage lottery funded, national lottery heritage funded project in um, the South Downs area called Heathlands Reunited. So several of the landowners have benefited from that. Um, the big problem is what happens after those funding streams end. And that's where it requires quite a, a lot of effort from um, volunteers, I think, and, and from um, conservation NGOs just pointing out to landowners when their sites are becoming unsuitable and trying to find methods of, of creating, continuing to create the bare ground. Of course, grazing animals are also very important, and that's uh, certainly something that we're trying to do more of on our sites. Thanks, Jane. Does any, do any of the other speakers have anything to add there? Yeah, Jim, I was just going to chip in. I, th I think I think that you know the, the truth is there's lots of there's lots of mini breaks on doing this um, across all sorts of sites. You know, lots of reasons why it doesn't doesn't happen. Um, and, and, you know, they can be about the, the site specific stuff to do with access and uh, the, the local community is not liking change. We have to be honest, quite a lot of this work when you first done, it does look like a bit of a mess. You know, I've, I've spent most of my career making a mess. Um, and I think we need to get better at actually showing befores and afters as well. You know, so there's a sort of lesson there for us. I think one of the things that, that slightly worries me as well, we've come up across fairly recently, which I don't know whether others have in, in, in a grassland situation. Situation, in this case chalk grassland where we wanted to create bare ground early successional chalk habitat and we run up against uh, basic payment issues and countryside stewardship issues where if you create bare ground within a grassland it's seen as reducing the, uh, the, the, the grazing area and therefore landowners have a reduced payment despite it being a sort of really important component of in this case chalk grassland. So I think there's myriad reasons why it doesn't happen. Um, and I think we've just got to talk about it as much as possible. There's dozens and dozens of really fantastic examples of where it's worked and where it hasn't quite worked, but stuff that you hadn't quite expected has come in. So um, 
uh, lots of opportunities, I think, but we've got to be aware that it's diff and, and it is difficult. You know, Sophie uh, uh, and, and Pip talked about, uh, I think Pip talked about UXO, um, you know, others have talked about archaeological sort of interests and things. There's lots of reasons that's kind of stop you from doing this, but it is just so essential that we do this wherever we can. I think we've just got to try and keep keep on and, and multiply what we've been doing. Thanks, Alistair. It's great. Yeah, let's keep on making a mess. Uh, I totally agree. Um, I think we've got two minutes left, so maybe time for one more quick question. Uh, so we've got one here from Michael, who asks, how useful are wild boar to habitat bare ground disturbance? Um, I'll just quickly chip in there that I know wild boar can be very useful and are favoured by some folks who work on particular taxa, uh, but from my narrow understanding of issues that there can be problems sometimes for some species. I know there's there's concerns about uh, the disturbance caused by, caused by wild boar for certain viper species on the continent and even sometimes where they've been introduced to Britain as well, wild boar, where they've been introduced. Any, any thoughts about wild boar from any of the speakers there? Um, well, they're on the Dangerous Animals Act, so they're, they're pretty difficult to actually um, reintroduce if you want to. Um, but there, obviously there are wild populations or naturalised populations in parts of the country. I think what, from RSPB's point of view, we're quite interested in trialling um, more native breeds of pig on some sites. And we've already started doing that in Dorset. And um, we're actually talking about that next week. So we might set up some trials elsewhere on predominantly heathland sites. Um, and yeah, they, they could be really good, but they're quite a blunt tool. Um, so our experience in Dorset is that they're great for creating complete, you know, muddy wallows. And they were enclosed, I should say. Um, these were Hungarian pigs, um, but they do, yes, they, they are a blunt tool and, and uh, they, they can take the bare ground a bit too far. So <laughs> be careful. Thanks for that. Right, I think we're gonna have to wrap up with just